matter where you find yourself, uh, no matter what kind of stuff is going on in your life, underneath it all, everything's actually all right. You're okay. You have more power than you. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to talk about all the books that I read in the month of July. And we're going to do that the same way as I did last month, because you guys really seem to enjoy that. Which means that I'm just going to go through my day, and then during that day, we're just going to have a bit of a chat about the books that I read this month. Right now I am sitting on my yoga mats because for the past few days I've been trying to start my days by doing some like 10 minute morning yoga and I don't want to sound like that person but it's been really great. <laughs> so now we're just gonna review the first three books that I read this month. That really sounds like quite the achievement but it's actually just three graphic novels and those are the three after the last airbender graphic novels called the search in case you're unaware there are a lot of after graphic novels uh, that take place right exactly after the end of the tv show the first arc is called the promise and the second arc is called the search and it's basically about what happened to zuko's mom the question that we all want to answer i read these five years ago for the first time and I basically just forgot what actually happened to Zuko's mom. So I was like, you know what? I'm kind of in a reading slump. I need a bit of a pick-me-up. I need something that I can get through pretty quickly and that I know that I'm gonna love. And so I reread them. And now I remember what happened to Zuko's mom. And now I feel like my inner 12-year-old can be at rest. If you are a big fan of After the Last Airbender, if you're gonna read any of the graphic novels, this should be the one because it's so important for to know this canon, I think. I remember when I first read these, I gave them all five stars and I just don't think I'm capable of giving them any less. Not because they're that good, but just because of nostalgia. In this book, we mostly follow Zuko actually and you know, him trying to figure out where the heck his mom went. And he travels with the gang and Azula is with them as well. Azula is kind of locked up, but they take her with them. There's a lot of focus on brother and sisterhood. There's a lot of development in the relationship between Azula and Zuko. And I really enjoyed seeing that. I'm genuinely impressed by how well they translated all the characters from the show into these graphic novels because they really felt like the same characters. The only one that I was a little bit disappointed by was Sokka because I felt like, you know, in the show he really develops into this fantastic leader character, just this very interesting character. I felt like in these graphic novels he was kind of regressed back into just comic relief. So I would have liked to see a little bit more nuance in Sokka's character, but other than that, these are great and I highly recommend them. I really want to read all the After the Last Airbender graphic novels because I will never stop loving that show. I put my shirt, this is one of my favorite shirts, and I put it in the hand wash and one half shrunk. Like this one's just all tiny and this one, this side's still okay. I don't know what happened. <laughs> uh, I kind of have to clean my room as you can see here. Not quite, but there's a lot of mess. And I'm gonna clean it and while I clean, we're going to talk about this book, The Library of the Unwritten by A.G. Hackwith. This book has a fantastically interesting premise. Just imagine a world where there's the hell and in hell there is the Library of the Unwritten, aka all of the books that were never finished. And sometimes characters from these books come to life and escape. And our main character, who's like the warden of this Library of the Unwritten, has to go after them. But then suddenly this evil book of the devil is stolen and she and her friends have to go and get it get it back an adventure across heaven earth and hell ensues i got this book from michelle in like our secret haul swap video and it sounded absolutely fantastic and what i can say about this book is that it's, i started out really enjoying it but ultimately it let me down and I'm kind of disappointed. It's a weird one. It's a weird one. Okay, we're gonna unpack it. We're gonna unpack this book together while I clean up my stuff. It's fun. It's action packed. There are constantly things happening. You get to see like different types of afterworlds from different mythologies. Initially, I was super excited, but when I was about not even halfway through, I started to notice that my interest in this book was wavering. And I couldn't really figure out why, but basically 
I never felt a need to pick up the book again and whenever I was reading it, even though cool things were happening all the time, I had to force myself to continue reading. Something about this book never made me want to pick it up again or continue reading. And I really don't like it if I'm not enjoying a book, but I don't understand why. And I was just trying to figure out why am I not enjoying this? Because the premise is so cool, there's constant action, the characters are pretty cool as well. What is it? that makes me not like this, because I just want to make it very clear to everyone, I completely understand why so many people love this book. I completely understand why some people give it five stars, because it is really cool. My verdict of this book is that it's one of those books that's extremely cool, but fails to make me care about anything that happens. And I knew that I wasn't the only one, because I've seen multiple other people online having a hard time getting through this book and wanting to DNF it. And I understood that sentiment. And after a lot of thought, I came to the conclusion that there are two things about this book that made me not care. The first thing is that pretty much the entire plot revolves around this, this book that was written by Lucifer that both people from heaven and hell need to get back. Everything in this book happens because the characters are just going after this book. To put it bluntly, I really did not care about that book. And I don't think we were ever really made to care about that book. The characters just go after it because it's their duty, because it's kind of their responsibility to get it back. But I never really felt the stakes of why we had to care so much about that book. And that brings me to like the second thing, which is the characters. There's not a lot of focus on the characters. It's mostly a plot-based book. And you guys know that I prefer books that are a little bit more character focused. And what I really didn't see from these characters was motivation. So I really felt like they were mostly acting, like I said, out of duty, out of responsibility for their job. But I didn't really feel like they had any interesting own motivations. And I think those two things together contributed to me not really caring about what was happening in this book. So I ended up giving it two stars because I thought it was just, it was fine. I think if you are a more plot-based reader and you're someone that can really love a book just like for its concepts and its myths, you're still really gonna love this book. But if you really have a hard time caring sometimes about characters and stories, I think the same thing's gonna happen to you with this one. Okay, so I think it's time that we talk about the fantasy series that I feel has basically just been my month of July. And that is The Broken Earth Trilogy by N.K. Jemisin. The first book is the fifth season. I don't have it with me because I immediately lend it out after I finished it. I don't know if anyone else ever has this, but sometimes you read a series where none of the books are five stars, but yet it still just like takes over your life and it's like the best thing in your life at that moment. That is what this series is for me right now. None of these books so far have been five stars, but yet I just want to talk to everyone about it. I really hope that I could finish the third book for this wrap up, but I still think I need another two days to finish it. And I don't want to rush it because I don't know about you, but last books in series, I really want to take my time with them. I really don't want to just rush them for a video, but I really needed to film this wrap up today. So we'll talk about this next month. But what we can do now is talk about the first and the second book. So let me explain, what is this series about? It's fantasy because it takes place in like another world, but it feels kind of sci-fi because the magic system, which is based on people that can create earthquakes, basically. Basically everyone in this world is tough <laughs> from after the last airbender. And it feels very sciencey. There's also just a lot of technology and mystery surrounding certain technology that makes it feel kind of like science fiction. It's definitely not one of those like whimsical magical fantasy stories. And although I do usually prefer those whimsical magical fantasy stories, I was pleasantly surprised with how much I liked the fact that it felt so science fiction-y. I would categorize, okay this may sound like really weird, but I would categorize this fantasy story as a mystery story because to me, the driving factor when I was reading it was basically just, I wanna, I wanna know what's going on. I want answers. You keep reading because you wanna know what happened in the past, what made it so that the world is the way that it is right now. Like every few years, there is a fifth season, which is like 
a season of death, a prolonged winter, kind of like an apocalypse where it's just earthquakes and volcanic eruptions everywhere and it's kind of terrible for everyone. And you're just trying to figure out what is going on? Why these things are happening? Why are there floating crystals in the sky? <laughs> the plot is not necessarily very like action-packed. The characters are interesting. I do like them. They really support the story, but they're also not the reason that you keep reading. The reason that I kept reading this book is really because of the story of this world and what it says. Because thematically, so far, these books are really strong. They talk about parenthood, they talk about nature, they talk about discrimination, oppression, imperialism. <sighs> Wonderful. Tea. Oh no! Ah, it's been seeping for way too long. Oh, it's so dark. Ooh. When I started the fifth season, I was immediately pulled into the story. The writing style is very distinct, like N.K. Jemisin has a very clear voice. And I always thought that when people say a book has beautiful writing, that that is like synonymous with basically just not understandable writing. But I think N.K. Jemisin has a writing style that is both very readable and palatable, but also clearly very beautiful and distinct for her. One of the big things about this series is that one of the perspectives that you follow is in second person perspective, so it's you did this, you thought this, which can be a deal breaker for some people, but personally I was immediately used to it and I really liked the extra dimension of intimacy it added. My favorite thing about the first book is the world building and how there is absolutely no telling, just showing. You are thrown into this book, you're probably gonna be confused for the first 50 to maybe 100 pages because nothing is explained to you. You really have to piece it all together, you really have to figure it all out. And I personally really enjoyed that, but I can understand that that could also be like a possible deal breaker for some people. The second book, in my opinion, kind of turned that around and ended up actually giving some pretty big info dumps, which I thought was a, a kind of a more weaker point about the second book. But what the Obelisk Gate lacks in intricate storytelling and world building, it gains in more focus on the themes. And also this book made me cry, um, which books rarely do. So <laughs> at the end of the day, after finishing this book, I didn't feel like we really progressed that much further into the plots. As where we started out. But ultimately I gave the fifth season four and a half stars, the Obelisk Gate I gave three and a half stars, and I'm really excited to see what I'm gonna think of the Stone Sky. Anyway, I could ramble on and on about this series. I have so many like little thoughts, little nitbits about every single thing that's happening. Basically, I highly recommend- wow that was a really smooth just- basically. <laughs> One of the characters in this series, Alabaster, has become one of my favorite characters of all time. I love him. I highly recommend this series if you are in the mood for a unique fantasy story that feels like no other fantasy stories that I've ever read. A book that is really gonna enthrall you and something that kind of has like that mystery element where you're just really gonna try to figure out what's going on. So yeah, I'm gonna finish the Stone Sky hopefully in the next few days and then I can talk to you guys about it in my August wrap-up. Yeah. <laughs> bonus book! We have a bonus book! So I just finished listening to an audiobook and that audiobook was a You Should See Me in a Crown. So I thought, you know what? We're just gonna talk about that right now in this wrap-up still. <laughs> so You Should See Me in a Crown is a YA contemporary, like a, about a girl in high school who really wants to go to, I think this kind of conservatorium? Is that the word for it? Like music school? Because she really likes playing the clarinet, but she doesn't have enough money to go there. Basically, the opportunity presents itself that if you win prom queen, you will get a bunch of money. And that happens to just be enough money for her to go to the school that she wants to. So she decides to run for prom queen, even though she has all the, all the odds stacked against her. She's pretty unpopular, she's poor, she's black, and she likes girls. And I guess you, and I think you can all guess what the rest of the story is gonna be. <laughs> so I thought this was really cute, but I think other people would enjoy it more than I did, if that makes sense. Let me just get my notes. Notes. 
So let me just start with all the things that I really liked about this story. I really loved the main character, Liz, well-rounded. I really cared for her. She had all these interesting relationships with her friends, old friends, the fact that she wants to go to music school, her family life. It all felt very genuine and authentic and I really enjoyed reading about her. Also, obviously the premise of the story is just chef's kiss. There's this beautiful friendship between our main character Liz and a boy that she's been friends with since like childhood but they've kind of grown apart in high school because he's like really popular and she's kind of unpopular and I really enjoyed just the exploration of the friendship between them and I also really appreciated how this story just despite being you know at the surface just being this really cute fun contemporary it also effortlessly weaved in conversations about racism, LGBT issues, class, friendship. So overall I thought the story was cute but I think the main thing that I didn't give this like more than three stars is that the romance just wasn't for me. <laughs> it's a very cutesy romance where the main character falls in love with this girl who's like the new kid at school and she's immediately mesmerized by her she immediately has a crush on her and it's pretty much smooth sailing they like each other from there on which is just personally not my thing but i can see that other people actually really crave a story like that i do think it's well executed for what it is personally i just don't like it when the main character like immediately falls in love with the love interest I don't know, I just like to see characters suffer, I guess. <laughs> and I also personally wasn't really a fan of the love interest because I felt like she just wasn't very developed. Like, especially in comparison with the main character who I thought was very developed and interesting. I felt the love interest was mostly just beautiful and pretty and then she had like one character trait and that was about it. And we never really get to see her background or more about her character. And I just didn't really care about our love interest, sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> and the romance really walks the line, at least for me, between cute and eye roll worthy. <laughs> but that's just because my threshold for finding something cute is really high and I'm very quick to find something cringy. This is one of those books where the main character unironically says that she doesn't believe in first sight but that her love interest made her believe in it. Like, <laughs> it's just, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I just can't. So I think if you're looking for just a really cute fluffy romance then this book is definitely a good book for you because I totally understand why other people found this so cute and fluffy but it's just not really my thing. I did like it though. I still gave it three stars. I liked it but I was not blown away by it as other people were. And that concludes this reading wrap up. I really hope you enjoyed this video. I can't wait till next month. So I can talk to you again about the books I read. I always love making these wrap up videos. Let me know in the comments if there's any book that you really love this month. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram if you like and I will see you soon in another video. Goodbye!